Hello guys and uh, welcome back to my channel. I've been absent for a while but hopefully we'll be posting a lot more papers in the coming weeks. When it comes to any form of paper, right, and the one I'll be focusing on today is our IB November 2020 paper one for Maths Core, please make sure that you always look at your instructions. Now the instructions are always pretty standard but they tell you how many pages they are. Be careful that you have the number of pages that are stipulated. It also tells you to how many decimal places you must round off, which is quite important. And then it also tells you that you have some extra um, pages at the back should you need them to do working out. Okay, so just note all of those things. Let's jump in. Um, as I just turn over the page, I just want to say, please remember that there's always a section A and a section B in these papers. Section A generally is going to be an easier are going to be the easier questions where you should be getting the majority of your marks. Session B is where it gets a little bit more complex, not impossible, but a bit more difficult to get all the marks that are given. Okay, well, all the marks that are available. So let's just get going. So here it says, given that 3 minus 2x equals px squared, where p is not zero, solve for x in terms of p, leaving your answer in simplest form. Now, what happens when students see this is they automatically switch off because they're, now they're like, oh, there's two variables. What the heck am I doing? Like, I don't know what's going on. What you need to do is you need to say, okay, let me go back to my basics. I know that when there's an x squared in an equation, I know that that means that I'm looking at a quadratic, right? So let me just go make this equal to zero, right? Um, and keep it in sort of a quadratic form. And let's see whether we can work with it that way. So that's the first thing I would do, right? The reason being is that you make it equal to zero. We know that when we're solving for x, that's generally what we're gonna do, right? When we have an equation, we make one side equal zero, and the other side, we're going to solve and try to get in terms of x. Now, students sometimes say, oh, okay, I don't know what to do now. We know that this is a quadratic, so what should you, should you be thinking? You should be thinking, okay, because I can't just plug this into my calculator because I have this p, which is unknown, but I do know that I have the quadratic equation, which I can always use to solve for my unknowns of an x, right? So let's go and plug that in. So we know that x equals negative b. Please remember that your b value is going to be your coefficient of your x, um, your x term, and your a value is going to be your coefficient of your x squared term, and then your c value is going to be your constant. Right, so I'm just going to write out the equation here, just so that you see. This is all from the formula sheet, so don't be thinking, oh goodness, where's she getting this from? It's all from the formula sheet. And then I'm going to take each of those values, which I've said are a, b, and c, and sub them in. So b is going to be 2 plus minus, then it's going to be 2 squared minus 4. What's a? a is p. What is c? It is negative 3 then what is A, we know is P, okay? Let's just go and simplify all of this, and we get four plus 12P, okay? Now, what we should do in these cases is it did say in simplest form, right? So, sorry, let me just make sure you can see that. When it says simplest form, generally it means you should do some form of factorization. You should see here that all these terms kind of have um, a factor which we can take out. We know that the factor that we take out under the square root is going to be different to the factor we take out there, right? But let's think about it. So over here, I know that I could change this and make this 4, take out 4 of both those terms, and then it could become this, okay? Now you could be saying, why did you take out 4? Well, there's a couple of reasons why I took out 4 first reason I took out for was that it is the highest factor of both those terms. Also, 4 is a square number. So I know that this little square root here can become this, right? Because what is a square root of 4? It is 2. So I'm just going to write, sorry, I'm not using my space too well here, right? So <laughs> try to be a little bit neater than I'm being, right? But it's going to become negative 2 plus minus 2, 1 plus 3p over 2p, right? Then what we're going to do now is we're going to say, oh, well, now every single term that I have in this quadratic equation has a common factor of 2. So let me go and take that out. So I'm going to take 2 out there. That becomes negative 1 plus minus 
1 plus 3p over 2p. Cancel those twos and there is my answer. Okay, now you could be saying, jeepers, that's a lot of work, right, for three marks. And yes, to a degree it is, but it's fairly simplistic. First thing you do is you substitute in, right, and then you simplify, and then your answer is there, okay? Let's then go to our next question. It says, hence or otherwise, determine the values for P for which the roots will be non-real. Now, what it's testing here is, can you actually go and use use your quadratic equation right and can you interpret it what does non-real mean it means generally that you can have the root of a negative number right so over here right where's the root there's our root there we want that to be a negative number underneath that root so we're basically going to say well 1 plus 3p has to then be less than it has to be less than zero right it has to be negative Let's just go solve that like a normal equation and it's going to be p has to be less than one third okay oh sorry when i bring over this negative bring over that one it needs to be negative don't don't be sloppy with your algebra so in order for it to be non-real what does non-real mean it means it meets the root of a negative we look at the root over here we say well then this has to be the root of a negative p has to be less than negative one over three why did I start with negative or less than zero there? The reason being less than zero is a negative. And we know that we need a negative of that root. Okay, so this is just easing us in. I personally think this is quite a difficult start to the paper, but not impossible, right? You always have to go and be logical, go back to your first principles and work from there. Let's continue now to the next question. The next question is an interesting one because here is just sort of pure algebra. So it says here, solve for x showing all algebraic working, okay? With these sort of questions, what you wanna do when you see a root with more than one term underneath it, you generally want to put that root so that it is by itself, right, on one side. That's what you wanna do. Now, what is the opposite operation of a root, right? It is a square in this case, because this is a square root. The opposite of a square root is a square. So I'm going to square both sides. So this is going to become x minus two, and this is going to become x minus four, all squared. Please be careful. X minus four, all squared, you have to write out like this, okay? Some students are tempted to write this like this. Please, that is not right, and I'll show you why that's not right now, okay? So we do FOIL, please remember your FOIL, that's from the sort of grade nine maths. Times that out, it's going to become x squared, right? Minus 4x, minus 4x, plus 16. Perfect. Now, let's go tidy it up. So, it becomes x squared minus 8x minus x, plus 16, plus 2 equals 0. Remember, when we're solving, we generally want one side of our equation to be 0, because then we can factorize and then just solve for our x, right? So here, this becomes x squared minus 9x plus 18. You can just put this into your calculator, but you should be able to do this in your head. You say, what are my factors of my last term that will get me to 9, right? I'm going to think of 6 and 3, right? So I'm going to open my brackets. You always put your x's in there. We know that we want to get to a plus here, right? So we know that this has to be negative and negative because this has to be a negative there because we know negative six minus um, three gives me negative nine. Negative six times negative three gives me 18, which is what I want. So I'm gonna put six and I'm gonna put three. So x can either equal six or x can equal three. Now at this stage, you're probably thinking, oh, wonderful, we're done. Please remember, whenever you introduce or whenever you use a square, you always need to check your answers. Because what you do by introducing a square is sometimes you introduce a new um, solution that actually isn't the case. Because look here, if I say negative two squared, that gives me four. If I say two squared, it gives me four. Right? So if I'm looking at the root of 4, I actually have two solutions there. Right? But in this case, it might not work because we're looking with roots. 
right? So you always have to go and check your answers and plug them back in. So let's go check six, okay? If I say six minus two, it gives me the root of four, which gives me two. So that check that side. Let me say, well, what is six minus four then? It equals two. Do you see that these two equal? Therefore, you are fine. Six is one of our solutions. Let's go now, and I'm just gonna draw it like this. Let's go check three, okay? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug it in. So we're gonna say three minus two gives me, um, it's gonna give me the root of one, which gives me one. Then I'm gonna say the other side becomes three minus four, right? Do you see how I'm using the left-hand side and the right-hand side and seeing that they're equal? If they're equal, we know that it's a solution. If they're not, we know that there's a problem. This gives me minus one. Minus one and one are not the same number. Therefore, this is not a solution. So we say here, this is not valid, and my only solution is that. And that's why this question is out of five marks, because it needs you to check. There's marks allocated towards checking, right? So please don't forget, if you introduce a square when it comes to algebra and you square both sides, you need to go back and check. Okay, let's now go on to our last question here. So, or for this question, um, we have x plus three, x minus one is all greater than zero. And it says, please find the x values for which this is the case. So basically what it's saying is it's saying, this side needs to be positive because it's greater than zero, right? So what we always do here is you draw a little number line you put in your values, what are my critical values? My critical values would be minus three, x equals minus three, and x equals one. Because we basically say, if I say x plus three equal to zero, it would give me this. x minus one equal to zero would give me this. So go plug those into a number line. Then you need to say, I need to determine on either side, on, on sort of in between and either side of my critical values, is it positive or negative? And then I can give you an answer. So I'm just going to take a number on either side and in between these numbers and check whether it's positive or negative. So let's start with negative 4. If I say negative 4 plus 3, and you just sub it in, right? Negative 4 minus 1, that's going to give me minus 1 times by minus 5 which gives me five, so we know on this side, right, it's positive, right? So we know that we find there. Let's go and plug in zero. Zero plus three, zero minus one, gives me three times negative one, which gives me negative three. I said that I only want positive, so actually in between these two, I don't want any of those, right? These values in between negative three and one, they give me negatives. Do I want a negative value? No. I said I wanted positive values for this to be the case, right, for this to be true. Let's go test over here, right? So let's go test where we sub in two. Two plus three, two minus one, that gives me five times by one, which gives me five, that's positive. So we know that we can sit there. So we know that either x needs to be less than or equal to negative three, or x needs to be greater than 1, greater than or equal to 1, right? So that's quite important because in doing this, often what students do is they'll just give sort of the critical values, but they don't necessarily think about what needs to be done with regard to what the question is saying. It says, tell me where this, these, this product here, when I times this bracket by this bracket, that it gives me a positive. Right? So we know that it's going to be over there, and we know that it's going to be over there. So don't, don't hesitate to draw the maths, right? There's an element of where you can draw maths and it actually makes it make a lot more sense. Okay, that's question one done. It's about 13 marks, right? Well, 13 marks in, in, in total. That's almost 10% of paper one. Let's now move on to question two.